have a very special guest who needs no introduction. Ellen Brown has written over 300 articles, and I'm sure many of us have read them numerous times or, or got into many of those papers. Ellen Brown is a, uh, a fellow of the Democracy Colo uh, Collaboration. Also, she has uh, uh, law degrees from um, uh, UCLA and also uh, from Berkeley, uh, attended there. And um, in some of my fun books of Ellen, of course, is um, Web of Debt. And I can't find my second one, but I did have the, her, late, her later one, uh, Banking, Banking on the People. I love that title, by the way. <laughs> I'm always banking on the people, too. So. <laughs> so thank you very much, Ellen. I know you had a cold earlier this week. We're all hoping you're feeling um, better now. And um, you say, uh, um, so. And I'm just going to say one more thing is that um, Ellen Brown started the Public Banking Institute, and it's a parallel organization to AMI and AFJM. And so we're, we're in similar tracks. And I think in time, we have to come closer together, but it's, it's to play along the way. And we're going to have a good, interesting perspective from Ellen and um, and we'll, and we'll have a little time for questions. It'll be an hour format. There'll be no breakout rooms. And so we'll have some questions at the end of Ellen's talk. And Ellen, one quick question. Did you wanna share your screen or did you want us to play, pay your, play your slides yourself? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I, I'd like to share my stuff. Okay. Myself. okay. Okay, great. Thank you for being here. You're, it, the floor is yours, Ellen. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Well, I'm in uh, Switzerland visiting my daughter and grandchildren, and uh, I'm not too sure of my connection here. So if if you have a problem, let me know. I'll switch to her computer, which is actually better. But there's babies over there. So, um, <clears throat> all right. So I'd like to. Um, I agree, Stephen, that we want to be aligned. We don't want to be competitors. And uh, we're all working on something that uh, where the government, we the people who um, collectively own or issue the money, whether we do it directly from the treasury or whether we do it through banks. So obviously I'm chairman of the Public Banking Institute. So obviously I'm going to talk about how we do it through banks. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Let's see. Share screen. It's working fine. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm going to talk about um, how we can solve today's funding crises with publicly owned banks as one option, of course, obviously not the only one, but to me, it might be, it's the most likely to happen because we already have public banks, banks already create our money supply. I mean, we don't, the radical transformation that we all can envision, envision someday uh, would be hard to pull off with the current uh, political situation. So we are dealing with a confluence of crises at the moment. Uh, failing infrastructure, record inflation, environmental catastrophes, supply chain disruptions, and war. And all those things need funding, but Congress, of course, this Congress is not prone to raising taxes or to doing more borrowing since we already have a $31 trillion federal debt. And the, the understanding is that if we do more borrowing, it will um, be inflationary and we already have a serious inflation problem. I'm not sure that's true, but anyway, that's what economists and politicians think and it'll be difficult to change their mind on that. So, and you all probably know all this already, so I'll try to do it fast, but <clears throat> so our founding fathers also faced some of these pro those problems. They did, uh, the colonists resisted taxation. They didn't have gold and silver much anyway, at least they didn't have gold. 
Um, so what they did was issue their own money and their own credit for trade. This was called the American System by Henry Clay and Henry Carey, who was um, Lincoln's economic advisor. And it allowed the Amer American colonists to escape the British colonial system. The problem was that, so that was first done in uh, 1691 by the governor of Massachusetts when he needed uh, some money to fund a border war and didn't have anybody to borrow from. So he just issued paper receipts to the soldiers and then those wound up um, circulating in the economy as money. But it, these were supposedly advances against future taxes and it was difficult to to tax the money back. So particularly in the Northern colonies, uh, it wound up de in inflation and devaluing the currency. And the British merchants complained that they couldn't tell the, you know, that the values of the different currencies were unstable and they didn't know what they were dealing with. So, so that was a problem, but um, the Pennsylvania, oh, so we could do that today, we could just issue some trillion dollar coins and fix our problems, which I think would be a great idea. In fact, I actually proposed that in Web of Debt in 2007, and that idea was picked up by some by a, um, a man under the pseudonym of Beowulf, and, and um, it got up as far as the administration, but the Obama administration said, no, we're not going to do it because it's a, it's a, a gimmick, and today you can be you can imagine they won't do it because they they would say no, it would be inflationary, and we've already got an inflation problem. So we're trying to reduce the money that's out there, not increase it. I mean, I would question whether it'd be inflationary if it went for the right purposes, but it's an argument we would probably lose. <clears throat> um, so what they did in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Pennsylvania Quakers formed a land bank. So instead of just issuing the money and spending it on whatever the treasury needed, they issued the money and lent it to the farmers at, um, um, I believe, 5% interest, which was, was a better interest rate than you could get from the Bank of England. But you couldn't even get a loan from the Bank of England anyway if you're a farmer. It's not like they had banks on every corner like they have today. So uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote, many that understand business very well, but have not a stock sufficient to the, of their own will be encouraged to borrow money to trade with when they have it at a moderate interest. And Adam Smith wrote the Pennsylvania paper currency uh, is said never to sunk below the value of gold and silver, which is current in the colony before the issue of paper money. So it, it retained its value, it was stable. The money went out and it came back. So it was a stable system. Um, Meanwhile, in 1694, the Bank of England was founded and it was on a different model where um, it was on the fractional reserve model that was developed by the goldsmiths. They had figured out that they could, um, they held people's gold for safekeeping and gave them goldsmith notes. And they figured out that they could issue 10 times as many notes as they had gold because people didn't want to carry gold around. They wanted, to, they preferred trading these paper notes. So that was the basis of the fractional reserve system. But the Bank of England was um, founded by a group of private investors and their idea was to make money off the government, of course. So it was chartered to be an instrument of government policy capitalized exclusively by public debt. The government would pay the private lenders who controlled what policies could be funded. Uh, <clears throat> so that so the colonists continued to, act, to issue um, their own currency until the Bank of England leaned on the king to uh, to forbid it, which he did. And uh, that led to a major depression because our money supply collapsed and uh, the American was a major trigger of the American Revolution. We won the war uh, funded largely with paper continentals backed solely by the anticipation of tax revenues. So Franklin said, the whole is a mystery, even to the politicians, how we could pay with paper that had no previously fixed fund appropriated specifically to redeem it. This currency, as we manage it, is a wonderful machine. And Thomas Paine called it a cornerstone of the revolution. <laughs> but the problem, again, was overprinting, not actually by the American colonists, but by the British, who, of course, it, then it was easy to counterfeit paper money. So they were they were running their own printing presses and... Uh, managed to devalue the currency to the point where by the end of the war it was worth virtually nothing 
and uh, the colonies were $44 million in debt. And of course, the colonies became the states. So it's quite controversial whether the national government wanted to assume that these debts, but um, Alexander Hamilton, our first, um, our first, our first uh, US Treasury Secretary managed to persuade Washington to, <laughs> to fund a bank with, with so they did debt for equity swaps where they would accept the state debt uh, in partial payment for stock in the first US bank. It was non-voting uh, stock that paid a 6% dividend. I know Hamilton's very controversial. When I first started writing about it, I was highly skeptical of it myself, but I've come around to rather liking the Hamiltonian system. <clears throat> so this capital was, uh, this. This capital was leveraged into credit, uh, which became the first US currency. And it was on the fractional reserve model for which of course Hamilton has been criticized, but he wrote, it is a well-established fact that banks in good credit can circulate a far greater sum than the actual quantum uh, of their capital in gold and silver. <clears throat> and the difference between the bank for the first US bank and the Bank of England was that um, Hamilton said the primary function of the bank was to issue credit for internal improvements and other economic development. So it's basically an infrastructure bank um, designed according to his system of public credit, which was an important paper that he wrote. <clears throat> the bank was intended to establish a sovereign currency, a banking system, and a source of credit to build the nation, creating productive wealth, not just financial profit for speculative investors, which is what the Bank of England was basically all about. It was to generate capital for agriculture and manufacturers, increasing the quantity and quality of labor and industry. <clears throat> I can't even read my own thing. Um, anyway, it was only later that Wall Street used this credit for speculation rather than building the economy and gouging the public with these serious interest rates for short-term financial gain rather than economic growth. So this was what um, Henry Clay and Henry Carey called the British system, which is basically about exploiting the colonies through free trade. <clears throat> and the, bank, the first US bank, by contrast, was to be a self-funding commercial bank generating credit for national infrastructure development. Uh, but it was only chartered for 20 years. And after the charter expired, uh, then we had various monetary issues. And so the second Bank of the United States was founded basically again on the Hamiltonian model. It, uh, it funded one of the most productive periods of intense periods of economic progress in history including the Erie Canal, that sort of thing. It invested directly in canals, railroads, roads, and coal and iron enterprises and loan money to states and cities engaged in such projects. But it was even more controversial than the first Bank of the United States. And of course, President Andrew Jackson shut it down. So that left President Lincoln in a bind. He was came into office dealing with the Civil War and the potential of having to borrow at 30% interest from um, I think Wall Street banks that were backed by British banks, anyways, basically borrowing from the British. So instead, he went back to the American system where he issued greenbacks, which were essentially colonial script. And he issued so many that he doubled the money supply. And um, uh, Chase, who was his uh, treasury secretary, founded the national bank system. Uh, where national banks were had to capitalize their banknotes with government debt. So those two sources of funding uh, allowed the North to win the war and funded quite rapid economic development, most famously the Transcontinental Railroad, on which the government not only managed to connect both ends of the country, but uh, turned a profit on the whole deal. That's the way banking worked. So, the money supply was doubled, and yet um, there was not inflation, not, not caused by printing money. And uh, or at least uh, Milton Friedman said that in his um, History of the United States, what, I don't remember the exact title, but anyway, that, uh, that there was actually less inflation during the Civil War. Of course, it, uh, paper money always hyper or deflated, hyperinflated, whatever, in 
comparison to gold, that was always true during wartime because there would be shortages, et cetera. But there was less such inflation than there was even in World War I and typically during wars. And it, he said it was not for money printing, it was from shortages. But of course, Lincoln was assassinated, the greenbacks were discontinued and silver was demonetized. Silver was basically the money of the people. And again, that shrunk the money supply. And so we didn't have enough money to run an economy and deep depression resulted. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the American system inspired an international movement. Other British colonies revolted, including Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, and other countries rebelled against the British imperial free trade doctrines and developed their own infrastructure manufacturing, including Germany, Ireland, Russia, Japan, India, Mexico, and South America. Uh, and I've got stuff up there, it's blocking my, anyway, um, so public development banks flowered in other ex-British colonies, first Australia, then in fact in Australia it was before the, before the Federal, before the Federal Reserve, then New Zealand and Canada, Commonwealth Bank of Australia was founded in 1911, um, based on the Hamiltonian model, so they basically just issued credit and uh, uh, did a great deal of national development and uh, um, funded Australia's participation in World War I just by issuing credit through their bank. And in Canada from 1939 to 74, the government borrowed directly from its own Bank of Canada, effectively interest-free and did, funded man, many uh, government projects, including their excellent medical system without increasing the national debt. And then we have uh, the postal bank model, um, notably the Japan Post Bank, which has been called the largest depository bank in the world. So J the Japanese people put their money in Japan Post Bank. And um, then Japan Post Bank's big biggest investment was in government bonds. So it was called Japan's second budget. It was sort of off budget financing. Uh, but the big banks, needless to say, complained that it was unfair competition. And so it started being privatized in um, 2007. And now it's only about half owned by, by the Japanese government. But the, U and the US too had an excellent postal banking system from 1912 to 1957 for 25 years. Uh, particularly during the Great Depression, people rushed to the postal banks because they paid 2% uh, interest, it was backed by the government, it was totally safe, and of course the private banks had all collapsed at that time. Um, meanwhile, in uh, 1913, we got the Federal Reserve, which was supposed to be set up to backstop the banks, but it did not succeed in preventing the Great Depression. It was set up because of a major banking crisis um, uh, you all probably know all that, so I won't go to it. Anyway, so what we wound up with were 12 Federal Reserve bank, banks that are all 100% owned by the private banks in their districts. Um, the, the Federal Reserve wound up issuing the national currency as Federal Reserve notes, and then the notes are sold to banks and bond dealers, and um, the U.S. government funds itself by issuing debt, which it sells on the open market to these bond dealers at interest. Uh, meanwhile, today, um, banks actually issue most of our money supply, this is according to the Bank of England. The National Bank Act uh, imposed a 10% bank tax on state charter banks that issued their own bank notes. The idea was to get them to join the national banking system, but uh, many banks avoided doing that by um, replacing bank notes with checkbooks. So basically you wrote your own bank note. The, the loan amount was just written into the borrower's account as a deposit and you were given a, a checkbook and then you could write the sum that you were <laughs> transferring to someone else. So that's how banks create money today. They just write the sum into the accounts, this, the borrowed sum into the account of the borrower, their customer. So for example, if you go to the bank to take out a $500,000 home loan, the bank will write $500,000 into your account and they will hand you a checkbook and you can then write a $500,000 check to your seller. And the bank will write it as $500,000 in liability to itself because it's gonna have to cover your check and it will write it on the other side of its books as a $500,000 asset to itself because you agreed to pay that back over time with 
with interest. So they say, well, we haven't created anything that it all comes out to zero. But as the Bank of England itself said in 2014, they said, contrary to popular belief, banks do not act simply as intermediaries lending out deposits that savers place with them, and nor did they multiply up central bank money to create new loans and deposits. Commercial banks create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. In fact, they said bank deposits make up 97% of the amount of money currently in circulation. Um, that was in 2014. They've kind of backtracked on that. And now they say it's 80% and 3% by the government and the rest is, is um, um, central bank reserves. But of course, central bank reserves don't actually circulate in the economy. So bank deposits are still by far the largest component of the circulating money supply. I saw that... Um, I can't remember his name. <laughs> um, well, anyway, a British a British economist I heard recently say it was 95% in the US. Um, meanwhile, we had uh, the worst banking crisis in history, which Federal Reserve did not stop and may have caused. What did stop it, what, what did manage to rebuild the country was a different um, government owned financial institution, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was set up by Hoover and Roosevelt took it over, or Roosevelt's government took it over. Um, they just funded it to start with, they capitalized it with a mere $500 million and the, the, uh, the RFC issued bonds. And over the course of 25 years, it lent or invested over $40 billion and rebuilt the country and funded the new deal in, in World War II. And with all that, turned a profit to the government. <clears throat> and it was not actually inflationary, uh, although it added money to the money supply, but the the supply itself was increased because the, the money went for productive purposes. And that, that is the secret to a public bank. You, it needs to be um, have a mandate to serve the public and the, the profits need to go back to the public and it needs to make loans that are productive, not speculative. <clears throat> so uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation wasn't actually a bank, it was it was a, a revolving fund. So it issued bonds and made loans at below market rates. And most of the bonds were actually bought by the treasury. <clears throat> but in some of the some of the loans were made like to farms and private businesses, but they were largely made to local governments and cities that were over their general obligation bond lim limits could pay for the bonds with or pay for the loans with revenue bonds. So they were basically repaid with the revenues generated by the works funded by the loans. And I think that's actually the ideal system that really credit <clears throat> or that money is an advance against future productivity. So in order to have a stable a credit system you need that's what you need that's what you need to back it with not not with uh, in speculative things but or not with assets that are just going to go up in, in value but back it with the productivity that the loan is going to create and the rfc provided off budget fund fi funding which was <laughs> the secret to it uh, why it was so exciting to politicians then so uh, James Butkowitz, who's a professor at the University of Delaware, wrote, the RFC was an executive agency with an ability to obtain funding to the treasury outside of the normal legislative process. Thus, the RFC could be used to finance a variety of favored projects and programs without obtaining legislative approval. RFC lending did not count toward budgetary expenditures. So the expansion of the role and influence of the government through the RFC was not reflected in the federal budget. And that is what we need today. We need some sort of workaround because you know Congress is not gonna, they're not gonna do any more infrastructure bills. They've done two major infrastructure bills and they're not gonna do it in this election cycle anyway. They've done two major infrastructure bills in the last year. One was the 2021 bipartisan infrastructure law and it mainly just went to highway programs and the Inflation Reduction Act that we just got, that was just passed. It mainly went to energy security and climate change, but there are many things <laughs> that still remain to be done. Most notably, we're according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, we're still short over $2 trillion in crit critical infrastructure. 
course, I live in California, so one thing we were very concerned about is water. Um, High-speed rail is another that's controversial, but anyway, it could be done. And then power transmission lines. So they they got funding for the energy, but how do you get the energy to where it needs to go? They don't have the transition transmission lines. So there there are numerous things we still need to fund and they're not being done by Congress. <clears throat> so we need a workaround like the RFC and off budget financing, which would also be what the Japan Post Bank would be called. The, um, the, I mean, the government needs a second budget like Japan Post Bank. <clears throat> so most infrastructure today is uh, built by state governments. But they are also deeply in debt. Uh, they borrow in the private bond market where interest and fees can be half the cost of infrastructure. In 2020, nationally, local governments paid $160 billion just in interest. And of course, all this, the fees go to Wall Street banks and the profits go to wealthy private and bondholders who typically live out of state. So you're siphoning money out of the economy rather than adding to it as you would be if you were creating money as credit on the books that went into the local economy. And the underwriting process itself for bonds is expensive. According to Moody's, the municipal bond default rate is very, very low. Between 1970 and 2012, it was 0.012%. And yet um, <clears throat> they have to jump through more expensive hoops in order to uh, certify the, their bonds than, than corporations do, which, which have a substantially higher default rate. And the bond, the bond underwriters get the fees and the, these big banks have been caught in collusion, bid rigging, bad swap advice, and they paid nearly $2 billion in fines and fees since 2000. So these are not really the people we want to get our public monies. So some uh, local governments have been borrowing directly from banks. About 20% of new municipal borrowings are direct bank loans. You can get lower rates from a bank. Uh, you can avoid, avoid a lot of fees, credit enhancements, et cetera. Uh, no need for voter approval. And you're actually creating new money as credit for the local economy. That's what Richard Werner says. He's an economist in, or a professor in England. He says, uh, if you want to get money into the local economy, uh, borrow from banks, not on the, in the bond market. So if we had, the RFC was not actually a depository bank, but if we had a national infrastructure bank that was a depository bank, we could do even more than the RFC could do. Uh, a depository bank can leverage its capital at 10 to 1. It can borrow cheaply from its own depositors or uh, on the bond market as the RFC did or of course from the Fed or from the repo market. Um, cities can repay these low interest loans with revenue bonds as happened during the 1930s if they, don't, if they can't tap up the taxpayers for any more. So we have the potential of rebuilding the country with a national infrastructure bank like happened in the 1930s. And there is such a bill on the books right now, which I've written about numerous times, the HR 3339, the National Infrastructure Bank Bill. It would be a depository bank. It would be capitalized with federal securities, paying a 2% dividend, which is basically the Hamiltonian model. Um, so in theory, you could take, it, say arguably, theoretically, you were able to put the whole $31 trillion federal debt <laughs> into use it to capitalize a bank, you could have a $310 trillion infrastructure bank. Of course, that's not gonna happen, but that's the theoretical potential of a bank that can leverage its funds for public purposes. We, of course, we don't want it happening for speculative private purposes, but if the public had that engine, that off budget financing, and if it were mandated to serve the public, if it had careful regular, you know, careful uh, setups so that you were sure it wasn't corrupt and being controlled by politicians. And if the loans went for, um, <clears throat> not for speculative or raising asset prices, but for uh, productive purposes, it, it could be a very good thing, even though I, under, I realize it's not a good thing when it's in the hands of Wall Street banks. Um, 
and, and it would be, it would fight inflation by increasing productivity. So there are two types of inflation, cost push and demand pull. And the Fed seems to think that what we have is uh, demand pull infl inflation, too much money out there. But what we really have today is cost push inflation. There's not enough, um, it's not that there's too much money, but too few goods. Of course, Milton Friedman said, uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. But he also said uh, inflation is uh, <coughs> too much money is uh, too much money chasing too few goods. So, so the Fed and other economists, conventional economists, are just looking at the money side of it. They're not looking at the goods. So the way to balance all that out is to increase the goods. And that's not something that the Federal Reserve can even do. It's not in their control. We need something else to do it. If you raise it, what they're doing is raising interest rates and dumping the bonds that they're holding on their books into, into the market. Uh, <clears throat> but businesses need cheap available credit for production. So if you raise interest rates, you're going to increase prices because you're going to increase the, um, the cost of the businesses themselves. So we've got cost push inflation for the last three years due to lockdowns, 200,000 US small and medium sized businesses closed permanently in 2020. We've got supply chain and delivery issues. We've got worker shortages. So there's a push to raise rate wages. Uh, COVID relief, which was not a bad idea, was given to the unemployed during COVID. So, so they were making the money that they used to be making, but the problem is they're not making the products that they used to be making because they're not working. So you've got demand staying at the same level, but supply is going down. So we need to get supply back up. And then, of course, you got uh, shortages of commodities and materials. And most recently, we've got the problem of war. Uh, Russia is a major supplier of key raw materials, as you can see here. And uh, the, the whole the <clears throat> Fed system is not working. According to its favorite gauge, the PCE, which is the Personal Consumption Expend ex Expenditures <laughs> Monitor, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's still going up, 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 despite the raising of interest rates. And again, that for obvious reasons, if you raise rates on businesses, you're going to make their costs go up, and they will therefore have to raise their their prices to cover their costs. <clears throat> uh, I, can't even, <laughs> I can't see that myself. Um, so the solution is to increase local produ productivity and the stellar model is China, which went from one of the poorest countries in the world to global economic powerhouse in four decades, including building 12,000 miles of high-speed rail in, it in a mere decade, along with the world's largest dam and power station. So how did they do that? The government owns 80% of Chinese banking assets, including three major development banks. And uh, the government banks are funded these projects with credit, and then the fees repaid the loans. So the fees for <laughs> sorry, it's hot in here. The fees fees for the for the rail and for the energy generated by the dams um, repaid the loans. So the money supply in the last 23 years has gone up by 1,800%. It's increased, increased by a factor of 18, and yet prices haven't, or yeah, prices have remained stable. So why is that? Because supply went up at the same rate. So some, supply and demand have gone up um, together and prices remain stable. Uh, and another important factor, according to Richard Werner, is that you need a network of local public banks, or local banks, he says, and in China, of course, they are large, largely public. China has a broad network of local banks which know the local economy and businesses and are willing to take risks because of the backing of the big national government banks. <clears throat> Germany is another excellent model. They have a um, development bank called KFW, which works with an extensive local banking network, the Sparkassen Banks, and they funded Germany's uh, transition to green energy, <laughs> whatever you think about that one way or another. But anyway, it worked, they got the funding. KFW also provided 1% loans to small businesses during the pandemic, and it assumes a large part of the risk of business loans for investment or working capital. But the country that has the most uh, local banks or the most banks globally is the United States. The problem is we don't have any national coordinating bank 
uh, for infrastructure and development. So community banks have shrunk radically in the last 15 years, uh, except for North Dakota, which has the most local banks per capita. And its secret seems to be the state-owned Bank of North Dakota. That's our only, only model of a, it's been around for over a hundred years and it's highly, highly um, profitable and effective. And um, it helps the local banks with um, capitalization and liquidity and by alleviate, it assumes some of the risk of the loans. Uh, I actually, I actually first, I started writing about it in the uh, fall of 2008, I actually heard about it at, uh, at an American Monetary Institute conference from a speaker who was saying that states should be issuing their own money uh, through, you know, have their own banks and issuing their own money. So after his speech, I asked him, well, are there any states that have their own banks? And he said, well, there's one, but it's it, North Dakota. He said, but it's just an ordinary bank. It doesn't do anything that, that uh, other banks don't do. Um, so, but I, it piqued my interest, so I looked into it, and then I discovered that uh, North Dakota was the only state that never went in the red. It, uh, it, escaped, it entirely escaped the credit crisis. It had the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate, and the most local banks per capita. And by 2014, according to the Wall Street Journal, it was more profitable than Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan Chase. So how could that even be possible? It was because they had low overhead. They didn't have, the, the profits weren't being sick, sucked out by investors and they didn't have high paid CEOs and executives, et cetera. Um, and by 2021, according to their annual report, that was their latest annual report, the Bank of North Dakota has a return on investment of 15% and $10 billion in assets. So it's quite a big and productive bank. Um, it was founded in 1919 by uh, farmers who were losing their farms to out-of-state banks, big out-of-state banks, and they could see there was something corrupt going on, so they decided to form their own bank and their own granary, and their granary is still there too. So North Dakota distributed unemployment benefits through its community banks coordinated by the Bank of North Dakota 10 times faster than the slowest state and uh, small businesses in North Dakota secured more PPP funds per worker than any other state. So it's it's good, not just for the local banks, but it's good in crises. It, it steps right up in a crisis. So summing up, um, owning our own banks is one of several ways that we can recapture the money power. Uh, banks, not governments, create most of the money supply today as, for, as is widely acknowledged. And um, we can restore that power to the people by forming, by owning our own banks. So maybe not owning all of them, but at least some of them. Uh, and through such publicly owned banks, we can get affordable credit for local government, local businesses, local infrastructure, affordable housing, community land trusts, worker co-ops, and other underserved sections of the economy. So that's all I have to say. This is for more, more information. Those are my books on this subject. And, my website is ellenbrown.com and Public Banking Institute is at publicbankinginstitute.org. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ellen. That was a uh, beautiful presentation. And um, as, as the moderator, I'm gonna take liberty to, I, uh, to make one little comment and then start with a, a question to tease things a little bit. My, my, my thought though is, is just to reiterate that, and we just had a presentation before yours, Ellen, of, of dealing with MMT. And the one area that all three of us would go along with is when we look at the supply side, if you even counterfeited money, but if you're using that trillion dollar coin or whatever you have, and you're creating jobs, which means, as Ellen pointed out, on the supply side, you're going to increase the supply and you're going to give people that demand to, to, uh, to pay for those supplies, we're in good shape. It's only when we just take money, put it out there just to buy things, then we have a lot of money chasing too few goods. So um, uh, we all come together on that and, um, and good points. And we can see here where the, where Ellen can go along with 
fractional reserve banking, but owned by the public, you know, and 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 uh, pushing that. Now, I would be remiss. I want to go back in time again to where Alan started to the early the early system. In it is, and this is my question for Ellen that comes out of this, and if I can understand the slides, but the American system sort of refers to the colonial period, and we can say uh, colon the colony of Pennsylvania, or we can go back to Massachusetts, but Pennsylvania is the nicest example, and, and um, you referred to it, uh, plus uh, quoting Franklin, too, and, and all that wonderful stuff that's great. My I'm, my little question is, and then there's a reference to the first bank of the United States being that like the Hamiltonian model, and and it it begins the fractional reserve sum means where you can you can create money through fractional reserve, but you make it public, and and that's a thing. There's a distinguishment, though, I think, between American, the American system or the Pennsylvania system, we can say previous, when the public, all money is coming in from the public side. And, and if you need more money, it's the public. Uh, as we know, the Pennsylvania, we don't think was doing fractional reserve banking. We know by their accounting, they weren't. They, they, they had a... Uh, they could balance out their books straight and there was no fractional reservedness to it. So those are my little comments. But my question is, if you were able to go back, if Hamilton or Washington uh, could take you back in time, Alan Brown, how would you wanna start the country with a banking system and having it public? And, and the one, the, the concern I'm thinking about too is particularly, you pointed out at the end of the, uh, at the start of the bank, there was a $44 million debt. And, and in your first slide shows this mountain of debt for our grandchildren that we're looking upon. How could we, you know, what might have you been able to tell Hamilton or, or the founding father so we wouldn't even have this debt in the beginning? Yeah, well, I think you said the Bank of North Dakota didn't, oh, sorry, <laughs> the Bank of Pennsylvania, the land bank didn't uh, do fractional reserve lending, but they did just print the money, correct? Uh, yes. You know, printed, they just printed bank notes that, that were, yeah, and, and lent them out. So that's, they didn't need to do fraction, you know, they didn't need to magnify the capital that they had because they created the capital. And the, I would envision ultimately someday that we would have a system where banking was acknowledged to be a public utility and the banks actually were publicly owned, you know, and run for the benefit of the public. And you would have a, a treasury that would, one problem we have with setting up public banks is the whole liquidity problem. I mean, where are you going to get the money to cover the loans? Even though the bank creates money as deposits, when the deposits go out of the bank, they still have to um, cover it with bank reserves. And how do they get those? That they need some uh, big, big banks in Wall Street to have an easy access to the Federal Reserve or to the repo market or whatever. You know, they can get their liquidity, or they've got huge amounts of deposits, so they can get liquidity ba basically for free. But we, with our public banks that are just starting up, we have to struggle to find a source. We need some sort of public source, you know, treasury source that would issue the money directly. I, I mean, I would see it as moderated through public banks. So it would be issued for loans that went for productive purposes. And you would, it's kind of the way the spark doesn't work, banks work in Germany where you have, a, you have your small business and you go to the bank and you show them your business plan and you say, this is how I'm going to make, how I'm going to pay the loan back. And the bank actually works with the, with the business and says, well, we, you know, maybe, maybe you want to do this. I mean, they give them advice on setting up their businesses. So, so it's a, the, the bank does not really create money. It's really the borrower who creates money. What the bank does is back it and insure it. So if you went to the grocer and tried to pay for your grocery bill with an IOU, at least my grocer wouldn't take it because he doesn't know me. 
or she doesn't, it's usually a she, doesn't know me and uh, doesn't know, you know, whether I'm good for it, but you take your IOU to the bank and it will give you, you know, it'll, it'll give you a loan because it'll give you credit because they'll track you down. They'll figure out what you've got. They've, they'll figure out where to find you and, you know, what kind of, what kind of credit rating you have and all that stuff. So that's really the function of the bank is to ensure our private credit. And that's, it's really a partnership between the borrower and the bank. The bank can't create money on its books all by itself. It needs a borrower. So anyway, I would envision a system where local banks are uh, sort of intermediaries, you know, that that's their function is to check out the borrower and make sure that this loan is going to get paid back. And, and then, but you would have a source of liquidity that was the treasury, let's say, or the federal reserve, if it were actually federal, which of course we know it's not, but if it, you know, it was actually there to serve the public. So you have a source of a pool of money that you can draw from and use that to create credit that goes out to for productive purposes, not for speculative purposes. That's what I would envision ultimately. <laughs> and I, you know, I've heard MMT, I know MMT people that I like, and I it, it does puzzle me that they actually go for this system, but they too envision one day that we'll have a system where there'll be a big source of, you know, a big pot of credit that con that's government issued credit that we can tap into through some means i mean i envision it through public banks but yeah anyway. my my i think the ami stands for the ami dream and it's just sort of idealistic is that when hamilton starts the bank it would have been nice if they could have been producing all of the money as cash and putting that money into circulation as they could loan it in or they could spend it in but it, it, and there would be great advantage if it's working for the productive part. So you can create that trillion dollar coin or Hamilton can create a banking system. But if that first bank had been real money created by the United States government at that time, it would have been uh, public and it wouldn't have been accumulating debt. And, um, and if there's private banks at the time, they can be getting, indeed being, uh, getting grandmother's money in one account and actually making, uh, asking the depositors how they want to invest, risky or less risky. And so, and it's, it's the difference in our two ways, but both are good and, and, and I think they'll come together in time. We have a number of, I, I all I see is hands raised. So here, here comes a few <laughs> questions. We have. I, I think uh, Franz is first. Yeah, I do. It's <laughs> Franz, let's see, you, Sam. So, okay, Franz, go ahead. Wait, wait, you're muted, Franz. Franz, you're muted. He's. Wait, wait, wait. You muted yourself again. Still muted. One click, Franz. Yeah, okay. Hi, Franz, good. great to see you. <laughs> yes, uh, at first, congratulations with another good presentation. And my major question is, uh, knowing that the public uh, bank money, even in North Carolina, I think they are considering an, an, a state bank, state public bank, to what extent do you think this public bank model could function globally? And you can say, yeah, these and these, uh, there are several countries who might uh, accept this, but did, do you see conceptually that the model could be the future uh, of the uh, providing the, the, the funds for for any any good purpose. Yeah, I could see that conceptually, and I used to feel that that was a good thing. But now we've got the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset and the central bank digital currencies, and it's also 
ominously controversial and threatening and what they could potentially do with it. Just when, like when Canada cut off people's bank accounts just for making contributions to the truckers, which was sh shocking. So, so it's a bit scary. So it's, it's, it would certainly have to be very well protected, you know, with, I don't know, regulation or something. So I wouldn't see it anytime soon. And I think the EU model is kind of what, that was what it was tending toward. And it seems to be falling apart here. You can't do it without political representation, you know, without, you can't do it without democratic. As regards, um, as regards the big source, pot of, so, of, of money that would help the public banks because they really have to have initial cash and, and capital. Yeah, and certainly it's I've, got good, news. Too, I've got good news because that is exactly what the UN People's Bank is, is yeah, but, supposed to. There'll be a presentation later on. To, I know, uh, so I'm not going further, but I only want to say that that is a, a possibility. And it, it, it'll and France will definitely make sure it's public <laughs> and, and put some safeguards on it. So we'll hear get to that. And we want to entice you, Ellen, to hang around and let's get get into a few more. Last night we talked about it. Um, Zaid coming up with a whole public system for Malaysia, and uh, it, it it was an interesting conversation. Let's go on to Lucille. Lucille, can you give your question? Yeah, so um, I'm going to put it in the chat as well. Oh, there's my video. Sorry. <laughs> um, nice to see you, Ellen. Uh, I don't know if you remember me, but we have met at AMI and been communicating in email over the years a little. Anyhow, my question, uh, I'm just going to do the first one, and it's two-part. Um, I have a second, but we, I'll let to go on to others. So it seems that you... Uh, and first, thank you for your presentation, very, very solid. Um, it seems you advocate public money creation or credit creation lent into the economy through public banks side by side or part and parcel with the existing bank money system. So first, just, is that correct? Is that what you're Well, I, I would certainly prefer that it's all public. I mean, it should, money should be recognized as a public utility, just like water and, you know, anything that flows between people should be yeah. a public utility. But the thing okay. is, we're stuck with these private banks and politically they are in control and it's very hard. It's going to, you know, that would be difficult to, to legislate that all the banks are going to be public. So okay. we have to sneak in there. Well, no, <laughs> and show you know what? That we have a better model. Yeah. But Ellen, the difference is not all the banks be public, but all the means of exchange uh -oh. be public. So, but still, I think your well, answer. I mean, not necessarily. I mean, Bitcoin and com uh, community currencies, that's so not, they're all fine. Those aren't, those aren't, so, okay, let me just be clear though. You're, you are advocating for public credit creation injected into the economy through public bank, public banks that lend it, yeah. right? Yeah. And you're advocating that side by side with the existing bank money system, commercial banks that do that too. Yeah, only because we're stuck with it. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Yeah. We accept that we are, we have that now and you advocate yeah. this to happen in the existing system. So my question is sort of be a thought, thought experiment then. If that's what you advocate, not that it's what you really want. You really want, I think, public money and maybe public banks and public money. But put that aside, if you get, if that's what you want and you get it, you know, it's politically the compromise you need to get to the shift. Can you talk about, so the thought experiment, talk about how will it work to have both public and private entities creating money as interest bearing credit, all denominated in and accepted as the same currency here, US dollars. Yeah. Well, so can, what what might be the unintended consequences of that? 
of both. Understand? That's my question. Yeah, well, you can look at the at North Dakota and they that's what they've got. Bank of North Dakota is publicly owned. It collaborates, partners with the local banks, which are all privately owned. Of course, they're smaller. It doesn't have doesn't it's bigger, more powerful than the Wall Street banks. I mean, that's one point of the Bank of North Dakota is to keep the Wall Street banks out. So to strengthen the local banks so they can take the loans mm -hmm. and not give them up to out-of-state banks, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. Wall Street, but, you know, big. Okay, so if we times that by 50, yeah, that, that we have public banks in existence with all the commercial banks, what have you played out? Like, how will it work? What what will happen? What might be the good consequences? What might be the bad ones, especially unintended ones? Well, I think we have a lot of models going on all around the world. And if you just watch them and the, the Bank of North Dakota model is so effective, it just- I know, it, I'm just talking about the whole country. Copy it and Maybe arguably we could, but the, the Wall Street banks are so strong. I don't see how we're going to bump them out of place anytime soon. Right, but you're not. So how will how will it work? And might doing it actually lead to bumping them out? If so, how? Or might it be a acceleration of the insanity that we have? You know, I think both are possible, and I just I thought and maybe done that thing. Yeah, you know what? I just throw this out, which I what I think is incredibly interesting, and I don't really understand it is the euro dollar system. I mean, those banks banks outside the U.S. are not regulated by the Federal Reserve. They create money on their books as much as they want. No, there's no capital requirement, no deposit or reserve requirement and they they don't have to transfer reserves from one to another they just use it as a means of exchange among themselves apparently that's how the world economic forum big businesses are funded i mean we've got this whole thing that we're competing with globally that we don't even know about that's something i want to write about if i ever nail it down but i'll shut up since <laughs> there isn't much okay. time up here thank you thank you um uh, um, Mr. Orduno, Ordonez is in India, and so I'm going to go to Sam and let him ask one more question, if we could. Okay, I I feel like maybe I've hogged the questioning though. So actually, I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to put my hand down and let it go to Fernanda. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah. Fernanda. Hi. 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 Uh, let me get to my screen where I'm asking it. Um, so I really liked your perspective. Um, I think it's pretty empowering to say that the people are the ones that create the credit and the banks are kind of just like backing it up. That uh, feels really, really important. And I, I want to maybe ask if you think that um, that relates to just how much um, how much the the bankers who make the loans like would trust one group of um, society over others, and rather if it's more of a a spiritual preference <laughs> type of question as to how their relationships are going with the different groups of society. Um, and I'm thinking like about white supremacy and um, all of the um, other intersectional issues that really um, have to do with which um, people get funded. Um, another question I have is if public money, public banking has an environmental message in itself, um, particularly because it was kind of concerning to me that you brought up that, um, well, to increase um, how well the economy is doing and we have to increase productivity, I would uh, rather say that we kind of need to like just put the the money onto things that are already happening like volunteer work like domestic work um so kind of like we don't need to increase productivity there's already enough waste in the world so kind of just wondering those two things thank you so much for your presentation okay all right well our productivity uh, it, there are many things we can invest in that are not going to use up resources like one thing i think we need is a lot more research in alternative sources of energy because we don't really have I mean, windmills are not really going to, you know, empower the country. There's just a lot of issues with the current 
alternatives. We need new alternatives. And so we could put, I mean, they're just, we could put money into education for, to educate people so they can produce things more efficiently and more use products more efficiently and use waste more efficiently, all that kind of stuff. I mean, there are ways, if we apply science correctly, we can save resources rather than use them up, but that we need the science and we need to put money into developing all those things. So I agree, we don't want to just pump, you know, just be doing more plastics and that sort of thing. I'm sorry, I've forgotten your first question. <laughs> Could you remind me what the first question was? Oh, about whether there are particular groups. Well, big banks, obviously, everyone knows that they get the money first and it's the, the you know, they, they give, make cheap loans to their big clients because of course they know their big clients like maybe uh, BlackRock or, you know, Vanguard, et cetera. They know they're gonna get paid back. And uh, there's like, well, anyway, that we know that the money goes to certain interest groups and certainly doesn't go to- So, so how can we incentivize um, the banks to really look equally at giving opportunities to, I guess it's kind of like that equal opportunity banking. A lot of local yeah. banks say no, that they do that. Yeah, yeah, that is that is what local public banks do. That's what the Sparkasm banks do. I mean, they look at your business model for your own new business that you want to start. And in China, of course, you have all kinds of local public, well, they're not all kinds of local banks anyway, and they're looking at local business. Um, <clears throat> And I guess lastly, to, to follow up, like how would a, like if you're a new person looking at investing in local banks, how do you make sure that the local bank is going to be reputable? I mean, this might be out of the scope of this presentation. Yeah. We're hoping to do well, lots of we, workshops on, and, on that. We, we have, AFJ. currently we have 36 groups, I think, working on local banks for in their regions. And we've got over 30 bills pending. And we've had well over 50 bills, but they seem to wind up, you know, where bills go to die, you know, and uh, anyway, we haven't managed to get any passed except in California. We, well, anyway, long story, but uh, we, we do work on that. And the proposed model is that you have an, um, you know, a certain number, you know, you pull representatives from all over the local economy and make sure that they that they do investing for small and medium sized businesses and do it equitably and all that sort of thing. Yeah, so it, we definitely <laughs> look in, you know, we try hard to do all that stuff. That's an important, important feature. Let me, let me cut in and Ellen, how are you doing? Are you ready to take a break or, you, or can you do another question or so? Oh, I'm fine. I can do more questions. Okay. Well, I'm going to skip Mike because he's. I want to get to some new people. John, uh, could you give your question? Yeah. Hi, Ellen. It was a very nice presentation, and I'm from India right now. Oh, cool. <clears throat> Hello. So. Yeah. I would like to like ask you about an interesting thing that has happened in India uh, in the month of, I think, January or February of 2022. The government of India, I think I'll tell you the story first. Uh, in India, what happens? I think, you know, the farmers are poor and you have heard about stories like many of the farmers after taking loans and all, when they cannot repay back the loans, they do some suicide and all this thing and all. So what the government of India has done is like, uh, they have started issuing a card known as Kisan card. Kisan means farmer in Hindi. So in English, if you tell me, it's like a farmer's card. So what happens in the farmer's card is like, the farmer will be given a kind of a limited amount of credit, but it will be based on inflation. So I'm just giving an example. Suppose I'm a farmer and I would like to produce this bottle. So right now it costs me around 40 rupees in Indian currency here. So suppose tomorrow the price of this bottle gets increased to 60 rupees. So me being a farmer, I'm going to get a credit of around 60 rupees tomorrow rather than getting the 40 rupees so that I'm not in a kind of a stress and all. So what I want to ask you is like, I have actually, I have like quite, a, I'm a fan of yours. I read one of your book also. So that is why I, I wanted to ask like for a long time, I wanted to ask this question. Can something like this can be done in the banking system so that like for particular task or for particular kind of 
jobs or for particular kind of any investment and all the government will decide like how much credit should be given so that the person who's taking the credit he's not stressed out and that is how maybe we can level out something so can something can be done like that that is my question uh, well, that's an one, interesting question. I, I haven't question. explored it, so I'm afraid I can't really answer. But uh, I'll think about it. Maybe somebody else has thought that through. <laughs> okay, let's go to another. Uh, I'm new people. Thank you. Good Janice. talking to you. Yeah. Thank you too, John. Janice, you. if you could unmute, and we'd like to hear your question. Thank you. Uh, very nice to see everyone and thank you for the incredible program so far. I'm sure it will remain so. Um, we have been exploring the idea of the whole completely shadow ignored invisible segment of uh, at least our economy. And I'm sure this, is, I know this is worldwide of the uh, productive people who simply do social productivity and are not capitalized or monetized in any way officially. Um, I just wanted to ask Ellen for maybe a brief comment and I'm gonna be working on this myself. Uh, it's a huge task and numbers will be made up from thin air because nobody knows any of this information, but it might be worth recording a guess of what this segment of the economy could be worth to the economy if it were monetized and slash capitalized. And I'm talking about people who do home house care, housewives, uh, people who drive people around, all of the un really unpaid for services that are so critical to the function of the population. Mm -hmm. I Well, of course, I have no idea what percentage that would be either. But I know, for example, in Japan, they have uh, community currency systems where you can get credits for doing things for your neighbors. And then, for example, if you take care of the elderly in your community, then you can use those credits, like maybe your parents are on the other side of the country, and you can use those credits for them, for somebody there. I mean, you could certainly envision a credit system that um, gave credit for, for all those things and uh, you know, would be an alternative money system. I know people are working on that sort of thing. I just don't know the answer about the <laughs> figures, but I'm glad you're working on it. Thank you. I'm just throwing it in. We might as well, you know, throw everything on the table. <laughs> right. Okay. Thanks. I'm going to go to uh, Bruce and then Mike, and then we should end things then. Okay, Bruce. Well, um, going back to the question of, of how public banking might change uh, uh, discriminatory, you know, picking of of, of uh, how it's invested. It seems to me that one of the uh, benefits of public banking is the different mission. The mission of a public bank is not profits for the bank. Um, it's, it's the mission is social productivity for that community. And it seems to me that that means that if there's discriminatory behavior, it's no longer the bank, it's the, um, it's the, it's the, uh, the public itself. Uh, in other words, so my my sense from the Bank of North Dakota is that that's a mixed mixed um, record, but it's but at least its purpose uh, is not profit for a precisely for a discriminatory population, namely the rich. Uh, so isn't that one of the major uh, differences between a public bank like Bank, bank of North Dakota and private yeah. bank? The very the very charter is different. Yeah, I, in North Dakota, I know the Bank of North Dakota has been criticized for funding the police in the, um, the uh, I'm not thinking of the word, but you know what I mean? The, what am I thinking of? Pipeline. Yeah, uh, right, the Dakota pipeline. Uh, but the police are part of the government. The government needed, you know, it needed funding. The thing is, there were people, there were neighbors there who were felt that they were being invaded by foreigners. You know, they, all these people were flooding in that were coming from. So you can set up the purpose of your bank, whatever your community wants. It seems to me that's, if your community likes a particular type of business, I don't know that, you know, they can fund that sort of business. And that's that's what a public bank does. It serves the, it serves the community, whatever is felt to serve the community. So, I mean, it is obviously, everybody knows it's a Republican state and it, it's not gonna have the same values as all those California people that, uh, whom I know, you know, that flooded in there to do their, 
to do right by the um, indigenous peoples. Yeah. Thanks. And and Mike, hold it if you uh, if you could give your question. And that'll be the last question. Oh, we made one more, but no, it's Mike. Let's go. Yes, uh, you hear me? Yes. Yeah. You look like you're on mute, though. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was wondering. Anyways, thank you for the presentation, Adam. I appreciate your perspective. Uh, and certainly, I think we all agree that we need massive restructuring and reform in uh, finance and thinking in substantive ways. We don't hear you very well, and, Mike. Uh, yeah, it's broken up. Mike, you Mike, you're well. Mike, you're broken up. Uh, okay. Let, let, we'll try in another second, perhaps. But okay, Sam, you get the last question then. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for the presentation and all of your work. Your your books uh, were some of the first things that actually your book was well, yeah, some of the first thing that brought me in um, here. Uh, I'm I'm feeling like we need big structural change, and and I'm aware of as you acknowledged how kind of slow the progress to get public bank set up is, especially right now. I feel like we are. I I believe that we are heading into a very deep. Uh, economic recession that's monetarily induced from, you know, uh, deflation of the money supply. And uh, I'm wondering, of all the solutions you've looked at across your career, what's the one that's the fastest acting uh, that you would point us to today? Well, that's why we're supporting the National Infrastructure Bank bill, because it seems to me that that is a public bank on the national level. And it is off budget funding, like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And if the RFC could do it in the 1930s, we should be able to do the do the same thing on that model. I mean, I know there's certain criticisms with that model too, but the, I figure they'll work it out. You know, the one thing about when you have bills, <laughs> they go to Congress, they they get changed and changed and changed until they're agreeable to everybody. So it probably won't come out the same way it went in. Thank you. That's a hopeful bill. Indeed. Thank you all. And thank you very much. We, everyone can give a wave <laughs> to Ellen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Get back to your family and, and have a wonderful rest of your visit. Thank you. I, I probably will get off because I've got kids here, and, but uh, but I'll, I'm, I want to listen to your whole thing because it's, you know, I'm sure it's very interesting and I want to know all these points of view. You said join back in at what time? Is that a particular time when there's a... Uh, uh, Franz's presentation is... Um, but you, you had said something about a time when there would be questions generally or social hour or something oh. like that. Yeah, our social hour is today at 5.30, which is 2.30 in the morning for you, so forget <laughs> it. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, you know what, there'll be the recordings. There was the Islamic yeah. public thinking that we talked about, Ellen, and um, that'll be on the AMI website. And, I, and once it's up there, I'm going to uh, email you and also I'll email or you'll have it for Franz and the UN public bank thinking. So we'll, um, you've been a part, we've been communicating quite regularly this last year and uh, you'll, we'll keep you informed. Okay, thank you very much. Thank I you, Great Ellen. work there. Great talking to everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.